Welcome back to the second episode of Lusitania for Ship Fist. When Lusitania completed her maiden voyage, she was greeted by thousands of spectators for one very important reason. Not only was it the completion of her first voyage across the world's most rough ocean, but she had also won the illustrious Blue Riband. This is an award provided to any ocean liner who could cross the North Atlantic, either east or west, the fastest. Lusitania had broken records crossing the North Atlantic in under five days, making an average speed of 24 knots. Winning the Blue Riband not only meant parties and social gatherings for the passengers and crew of the ship that won it, but it also meant handsome sums and bonuses for the company and marvelous marketing appeal for the years following. Lusitania won the hearts of many, being on the front pages of papers so regularly. As Lusitania's fame continued to exponentially increase with her speed and style, she also caught the attention of Captain William Turner, a former military man looking to change course slightly. Other famous passengers including Alfred Vanderbilt, the most successful entrepreneur in America and the richest man in the world, Charles Froman, most notably known for producing Peter Pan, and Mary Ryerson, wife of George Ryerson, founders of the Canadian Red Cross. While her size and speed caught the attention of the rich and famous, it was her interior spaces and public amenities, as you can see, described accurately as a floating palace that truly won the hearts of the world. Unlike former liners, which were by changing tastes dark and dreary, Lusitania had many stained glass windows and, and glass domes letting in light and air. Even her second class amenities and appointments far surpassed those offered on other ships. And finally, the icing on the cake for the passengers' perspective, including those in third, was the impeccable and very attentive white gloved service. For a while, it seemed like Lusitania's transatlantic routine was a party every week. And then, times changed. When Titanic sank, everything changed. There were two inquiries that took place shortly after, one in New York and one in England, to try to prevent the full scope of a disaster such as Titanic from repeating. As a result from these inquiries, it was determined that at least for Britain, every commercial merchant ship, whether it was an ocean liner, tugboat, etc., had an entirely new set of standards and regulations in order to be a legally registered ship. For Lusitania, this meant having an extensive overhaul, changing the watertight compartments, and ensuring she had enough lifeboats along her decks for everyone on board based on full occupancy. By the time Lusitania emerged anew from the dry docks after this refit, the world had erupted into a war. Germany had begun building what they call wolf packs, fleets of U-boats, which were very skilled at sinking allied merchant ships. Hoping to be more discreet, Lusitania's 70 foot tall plus bright red funnels were promptly painted black. And yes, you heard me right. Whether that was brave or foolish, Lusitania refused to stop operations as an ocean liner crossing the North Atlantic filled with German submarines every week in the middle of war. Typically, the Lusitania would be provided by the War Office in London with a military escort, as Britain had hoped to turn Lusitania eventually into a troop ship. My question to you, though, is what is everybody's plan if there are no available naval ships to protect Lusitania? Yeah, I guess you'll have to tune in next week and find out. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been great. And I'll see you next week on Shipfaced.